Sounds like you're all warmed up, ready to go. You are my king. You are my king. The spirit of adoption crieth Abba Father. To be able to sing like that in your heart, it moves it from this temporal place to the eternal. And we, we just declare to Abba Father in the name of Jesus, thank you. What a great time we've had this last two or three days and a great time already this morning. Uh, all of you do not have the, the extra joy of being able to sit through two messages. And uh, I'm looking forward to what Pastor Mike uh, is going to deliver in the second hour. So I know if some of you stay around for me, it's like two different messages. I don't know why. It must be God. But uh, Ro, would you please stand up? Please give another greeting, a round of applause, and a thank you to Pastor Roe Porter from Savannah Baptist Temple. Uh, God used him to just truly uh, and completely minister unto us through the word and just through his uh, sweet, wait a minute, sorry, not sweet, um, strong, manly countenance. No, his sweet spirit for the Lord, the man loves the Lord. And loves his wife and family and, and uh, loves his church, loves the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same is to be said for Brother Mike. Pastor Mike Matovich uh, has been pastoring for a long time. That's all I'll say. But he's just been serving the Lord for a very long time. And God has given him uh, much wisdom. And it has come from on high. And... Uh, for us, church, it's good. It's just really better than good. It's better to be able to have men like this that sacrifice a week, and they each preach every Sunday at their church. They each minister, shepherd the flock that God's called them to, and they lead as the chief shepherd leads them, and they're great examples. They have been in my life, and uh, as I told the men when I introduced Roe, I know it's been a privilege and honor for me to get a chance to know him and know him as a friend. I know it's been a great regret in his life to know me and have me in his life. But, you know, we're working through that. We're working through that, and uh, it's really good. But, no, I can't thank the Lord enough for bringing these two men to speak to us, preach to us. So this morning, I'd like you to greet, welcome, and be open to what the Lord has to speak as Pastor Mike comes and preaches the Word of God to us. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for being here. It is so good to have you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you for uh, allowing me to come, and uh, I'm glad our family at church has allowed us to come. And I've been blessed so much by being here at the men's conference, and it's just been such a super blessing. Brother Rowe just, I told him every night, I said, man, you hit the ball out of the park. You know, everybody's baseball around here, right? So anyway, I thought I'd keep the terms right. And it uh, just spoke to my heart. And I really, you know, you don't know how God's going to speak to you and who he's going to speak to you through. But if your ears are open and your heart is open, God will speak to you. And uh, I, I like to say when we have church at home, I say that hope is here. Everyone is welcome because Jesus changes everything. That's why we're here. The songs we sung about this morning, Jesus changes everything. The Word of God in our hearts will change us as well. I was telling the first congregation group this morning that uh, I've been doing a series called The Heart of a King, and I believe that the mess that we're in in this world today, especially in the United States of America, needs somebody that represents the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, somebody who has a heart after the heart of a king. So I want to challenge you this morning to think about it. My character is David. I used him, I think I preached for eight weeks, just finished it up last week. But right in the center was this message I'm going to share with you this morning. And I, I prayed a lot about it, and I was telling Roe that I think it was Thursday night, Friday night, God just said, do this. I had a whole, a whole other message in Ezekiel, which I think is a good, good message for another time. But it was more for me. And I didn't come here for me. I came here for you. But God did something for me, too. So thank you, Brother Roe and Brother Bobby and Brother Mark and, and all you guys, Randy. Everybody's just, uh, just loved on me. And I want to say also, some of you know that my wife went home to be with the Lord 
a few months ago, and we'd been married 54 years in one week exactly when she passed away. And we went together for two and a half years in high school, so most of my adult life, that woman was in my life, and she was my better part. And, uh, you know, she's been there, I think I counted it up yesterday, 176 days as of today in heaven, which is like that for her. I was telling our people last week, I said, you know, I, I still wonder, do they punch out at four? <laughs> do, do they come and praise for eight hours and then they go home? Or, what do they do? You know, it doesn't tell us, but whatever it is, it's okay, right? Whatever it is, it's all right with me, and I'm so thankful, and, and we've got some good friends over here, Sean and Courtney and his wife, and, and Shay and Josh are here, two couples from, well, Josh is not from Vegas, but uh, three out of the four are from the West Coast, and I'm just glad we had a little part in their life, helping them to know about the heart of a king. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says what? Keep thine heart for all, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of of life. Everything comes out of our heart. Everything that's going on goes on in our heart. You say, well, I'm just a thinker. Well, it comes from your heart. And so I want to talk to you about that today because people who have the heart of a king have a heart of royalty. They have a heart of virtue and nobility and of honor. They have a heart of servitude and character. They're different than the world. I tell you, I'm seeing a great group of these missing ingredients in the lives of a lot of people who overrule us and rule over us and control us to some degree. And people need to rise up like that because we are start, and we all start with the heart of a rebel. I want to do what I want to do, no matter what it is. We all not only start with the heart of a rebel, but we start with a heart of an orphan. We're not connected. We don't know to whom we belong. So God goes to great lengths through the scriptures to show us how intimate he is starting with Adam all the way through the Word of God and wanting to have fellowship with us, wanting to have communion with us, wanting us to talk to him. And like Roe was talking about, Abba, Father, go up and sit in his lap. I know at 5, 12 in the morning when I got the call from the emergency room that my wife had passed away, I was laying there and I was praying. And I'd been praying all night. And, uh, and uh, my good friend, Mike Wenzel, his son works for me now up in Montana, his wife, was killed in a car wreck 15 years earlier. And he called me at 9 o'clock in the morning and told me that and asked me to speak at her funeral, which is another amazing story. But I was laying there, and he said, Mike, a piece of you died last night. And I realized that I was laying there on my bed, and I was praying. I said, God, can you give me a glimpse of what it's like? And I kid you not, I'm not into signs and wonders and visions or anything else, but I'm laying there, and it's like I saw the back of Jesus' head in heaven. And my wife, in her glorified body, was walking up. And he said, welcome home, my daughter. Five seconds is all I got, and that's all I needed. And I said, it's okay from here. And I don't know, again, like if I just conjured it up, but I don't think so. I think God just said, take a little look. Just a glimpse. If we could just see him for a minute. If we could just get a bite of his heart, if we could just captivate in our hearts and souls who he is and what he wants to do, we wouldn't be an orphan. We also born with the heart of a Pharisee. We love to judge and criticize people, don't we? I thought that was one of the major doctrines of the Baptist church was to be a critic. I got a master's degree, a PhD in Phariseeism, you know. I remember those early days, man, we were the only ones right. I mean, we still are, but we're more moderate about it, right? We believe the Bible. We believe the Word of God. Others people, you know, I mean, there's other people that are not, you know, connected to us, and that's okay as long as they know the Lord Jesus is the king of their, their soul. And then we're also born as a slave. We're a servant. We're subservient to everything in life. We, we are born dependent on our parents. We're born dependent on them providing for us and taking care of us and keeping us clean and keeping us healthy and keeping us safe. And we're born dependent. We're born to come under people. And that's a very difficult thing for a lot of us because we don't know how to come under. So when we invite Jesus to come into our heart and soul, what we've done is we've invited a king to take up residence. Just like we sit on the lap of our Abba Father, he's a king. He's sitting on a throne. And you're sitting there with him. And guess what? When you got born again, he gave you his heart. He gave you his righteousness. He gave you his power. He gave you the ability to think, act, and be like him. That's what Jesus did for his father. 
And he wants to do that in us. So I want to talk to you today about a subject that I don't think any of us like. It's that subject of submission, surrender. Because I think that's really what causes the catalyst of getting a heart of a king. Is when we come into total surrender with the Lord. Submission to authority is something we don't like, but it is the heart of a king. And my example is the man David, King David. In Acts chapter 13, verse number 22, the Bible says this, And when he had removed him, now if you read the context of Acts chapter 13, Paul is on a missionary journey, and he's called into the synagogue to speak. And the ruler of the synagogue says, Do you have anything else to say to us? Speak on. I want you to remember that. This was a ruler. This was an authority that gave Paul license to speak. And he, in the context of speaking, he talks about King David. And here's what he says. And when he had removed him, talking about Saul, King Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, notice the description, the son of Jesse, that's important to remember, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all of my will. See, David was already submitted when God called him to be king. He was already had the heart of a king while he was in the shepherd business, while he was out tending to the sheep out in the field because he had learned to surrender to his father. He had the dirtiest job of all of his brothers. His other brothers were down fighting on the battle, or at least they were watching at the battle. This giant come down every day, say, hey, come on out, send your champion, and we'll fight. Whoever wins will be your servant or you can be our servant. But come on out. And, you know, Goliath was a pretty good boy, big boy, bigger than King Saul by at least two or three feet. And his brothers were down there watching. And so David goes, takes the sack lunch down there. And you know the story. He goes down and takes, picks up a few stones on the way. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? When you have the heart of a king, God gives you the tools you need for when you'll need them. And sometimes you don't. You, why do you think you're here? You're getting some tools. You're getting some stones in your bag to go do something for the king of kings, but you got to submit to pick up the bags. you got to bend over to do it. That's humility, which we'll talk about as the heart of the king as well. So David had already learned submission in his, in his father's house. He had submitted to his father. He learned to submit to Samuel, the prophet, when he came around. And God, God knows that he got the rottenest, dirtiest, wickedest king that he could get because the people wanted a king. You know, give us what we want. We want a king who has eyeballs like everybody else's king. And the Lord said, well, I'm your king. Okay, you want a king, I'll give you a king. He started out good, but he didn't finish. And by the way, let me just remind you, it's not how you start the race. It's do you finish the race. And I tell you, I've told our people, I've told the young men, I have eight men right now I'm mentoring and discipling to take over ministry. And I told them, I said, look, I'm not always going to be able to do this. So i got to have somebody that's going to be able to do it. But I want you to know I'm still in the race. I'm still going. Someone said, when are you going to fish? When are you going to retire? When they shovel the dirt in. You never retire in the ministry. You just transition a little bit to something a little bit different. But you always want to have influence in someone's life. So he's with the worst king that he could have, the worst ruler, the worst leader, the worst boss. Please keep that in mind. And the reason David was able to do that was because he had the heart of a king already. He wasn't actually the king officially, but he already had that heart. And that's why preparation is so, so important. Now, when we use the word submission, let me give you a kind of a definition I think will help us as we go throughout this lesson today. Submission means to come under someone else's mission. It's to surrender. It's like the word submarine. It's under the water. And submission literally means to come under someone else's authority, someone else's vision, someone else's dream or agenda. Somebody else, not you. I hope you'll get that. It's not you. God has an agenda, not yours. And if you line yours up with him, your agenda becomes his agenda. That's why he gives you his heart and his mind and his word so you can know what his agenda is. I mean, the church's agenda hasn't changed in 2,000 years, has it? I mean, we may do music and a few things a little differently, have buildings and whatnot. But basically, the agenda is to win people to Christ because we're living a godly life and then to disciple them and to mentor them to grow up and to do the same thing. Someone did that to me. Someone did that to the guy that led me to the Lord. Someone did that down the road a thousand years ago to somebody else and so and so and so on. And I got it. I got the gospel because of it. So you got to come under. And it's not a half-hearted thing. It's all-hearted. There's a good example in 1 Samuel chapter 14 talking in the context of David's life. is a young man named Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of the bad king. 
the bad boss, the bad leader. But Jonathan recognized something in David that was different than what he recognized in the powerful authority of his dad. He recognized there was a heart that cared, a heart that loved, a heart that had the best interest of Israel at stake. And in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, the story goes, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. And he's speaking of the Philistines. And it may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Now look at this. And the armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy wisdom, my skill, my heart. Jonathan and David are going to go down into the midst of these Philistines. And God can save by, we can kill them all. Let's go get them. I like that phrase. He said, well, let's go watch somebody else do it. No, let's go get him ourselves. Let's go do it ourselves. He said, I'm with you according to your heart. See, that submission, it's not just doing what the basic things is that we're asked to do. It's going and engaging the heart of the person. So I want you to think about this as we open up this message in a minute. Is that God has placed people in your life and over your life to draw you in to this submissive surrender to God's will for your life. And you got to see the bigger picture because if you stop and look at just your boss or look at your husband or look at your leaders in your life or your pastor, you're going to fall short of seeing the big picture. And I'm like you. I want to see it in high def with liquid crystal screen, with stereo sound, with uh, subwoofers, and I'm just vibrating. I love that bass up here today, man. I'm sitting over there. And my ribs were rattling. I, I, I thought, man, that is good stuff. I like that. But when you engage the entire heart, you get it. I mean, the father says what? Son, I've given you all authority in heaven and earth. It's all yours. Then the Lord Jesus Christ, he says to his disciples, I'm going to go away and I'm going to send you another comforter. And he's going to speak of me and teach you all these things. He's going to reprove the world of sin. And so the Holy Spirit's going to come and talk about me. And I'm talking about the father. You see how the submission and the authority goes, lines up? We get over to Matthew Good example in the New Testament. Jesus just given us an example in Matthew chapter 5 or chapter 8, verses 5 to 13 is the context. But verses 7 to 10 is what I want to read this morning. It says, And Jesus saith unto him, This is the centurion, I will come and heal him. Because the centurion, I mean, this is a Roman pagan for all practical purposes, but he got a sick servant. And here's the heart of the centurion I care about my servant. A good leader cares about those that are around him and those that are under him. He says, I want you to come and heal him. So Jesus said, I will. Verse 8, the centurion answered, said, Lord, love that. I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Now look at this. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. And said to them that followed, Verily I send to you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. That's from the high priests all the way down. That's from all the servants, all the scribes that were involved with the temple and the practices of Judaism. All those people that had been around the messages that had gone on. And when the centurion takes place, this story, Jesus is teaching his disciples something about authority. So he turns to them and he says, I've not found such great faith. He's including the 12. You might be a disciple here this morning, but listen up. God's got a message for you. You need to see what faith is and what faith does. Faith trusts the authority. Faith depends on the authority. Faith looks at God and says, God, not my will, but your will be done. So it takes faith. To get into the kingdom of God. So it takes faith to understand that the kingdom of God not only works with authority, because that is the heart of a king. So get that in mind. If it takes faith, I'm going to give you four little thoughts today about submission to authority. I think it will help us, help your church. It will help those that are listening online. And I'm, I'm just thankful that we have an opportunity to have a book that tells us the truth. Not parts of the truth, not my interpretation of the truth, but the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Amen. First of all, all authority comes from God. I think that's a, perhaps a given here at this church, but all authority does come from him. So David has run from Saul, who is the worst boss, the worst leader, and the worst king you could imagine for 10 years. 
He knows he's supposed to be king because Samuel already told him he was going to be king. But he's running and staying away from Saul, who is what? The authority over him because he's king of Israel. So he's running, but he has opportunity, countless opportunities to kill Saul. In fact, his guys are over there, those wild guys, you know, they were in debt and distressed and, and, and uh, discouraged. They all get around old David. I mean, you know, sometimes likes collect, and sometimes the real guy that's got strength and courage draws those people. That's probably why you're here today, because you know Jesus draws those people that are in debt, they're discouraged, and have doubt. He tries to draw them to himself. Come, come to me, he says. And so David is run, is, has these opportunities to kill the people. But he says to the guys, I'm not going to do it. In 1 Samuel 24, 6, it says, And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. That sounds like a leadership term, doesn't it? The Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So in other words, David says it doesn't matter how bad a leader he is. God has placed him over me over me. So I refuse to rebel against God by killing Saul to get what he's going to give me anyway. Someone once said, that's what happens with the devil. The devil's trying to give you what God wants to give you before you are ready to get it. Romans chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but God. The powers that are ordained of God Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, that they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Did you catch that? We need to submit to authority. I don't like wearing a mask. I don't think the science backs it up. You want to wear a mask? I can respect you. I can honor you for wearing it. And if I have to go to Home Depot to get a, uh, some nails or whatever, I'll put a mask on because I like Home Depot. If I want to go get some food and I've got to wear a mask to get in there, I'll get it. But I just don't wear the mask in my car. And when I'm out in the woods somewhere, I'm not wearing the mask. I don't think the trees care. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm just kind of skeptical of a lot of this control stuff. I'm kind of skeptical of people that are in the government that aren't righteous. However, I still am supposed to submit. Because God said, look, if you do that, you submit to God. If all authority comes from God, so then every boss, every manager, every coach, every parent, everybody who's over me is ordained of God. I was talking to a gentleman after the first service. He said, I really needed that this morning. He says, my boss is gay. I said, pray for him. Love on him. Because you don't know what the heart of God will do through your heart when you submit. And just do what they ask. Now, if they ask you something illegal, immoral, unbiblical, I can't do that right? I just can't do that. So if they don't ask you to do that, then just submit. And you know what will happen? Then that's their problem. I get tired of carrying everybody else's burdens, worrying about what they're going to do, what they're going to do. Why don't you just carry your burden? I got a big enough burden on my own, don't you think? I think you do too. Because if all authority comes from God, and I learned that, authority starts with the heart of God. Rebellion starts with the heart of Satan. I will exalt my throne. I will, I will sit up there. Oh, no, you won't, God said. Because I'm the authority. And he created him, and he was perfect in all of his ways, Ezekiel 28 says. So whether I submit or rebel, it's actually I'm doing it to God. That's important to remember. Why? Because authority comes from him. Think about it for a second. There are no leaders. There, if there were no leaders, there would be no vision. If there was no vision, there would be no order. And if there was no order, there would be no progress. I mean, how do you... How did I move to Las Vegas? I didn't say, well, I, I'm going to move to Vegas. I had to have a truck. I had to have the money to pay for it. I had to go have a place to go stay. And I had to lead to get to somewhere. I had to get on a, a call and get an airplane ticket to come here. And I had to go have a credit card account or a, a uh, bank account to have money to pay for the credit. I had to go, I had to go do so. I had to take some steps to get where I needed to go. And in this link called the heart of a king, to get where you need to go, God says, I'm trying to bring order by leaders and leadership. So we have this big call out there recently. That's not so much today, but defund the police. Do you know what you have when you defund the police? You have Portland, you have Seattle, you have Los Angeles, you have Oshkosh, Wisconsin, you have Washington, D.C., and I could name a bunch of other cities. You have chaos. You know what happens if we have no parents in the home? And God knows there are many homes that have no parents that have adults living there. I mean, put it another way, men and women live there with children. When you don't have parents, 
who love their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, what you have is chaos. We have no teachers in school. Can you imagine what's going on? If we had no boss at work, just show up, what do you do? Well, I don't know. When do you get paid? I don't know. What do I have to do to get paid? I don't know. What, who's going to do that? You know, you walk in, what do I have to do? What's my responsibility? So all authority comes from God. Everyone in your life, and I hate to break the news to you, everyone who has an authority over you is ordained of God. We could probably just close right there and have an invitation because most of us don't like that. Some of you ladies are still having problems with your husband because he wants you to do something. And he's not trying to be nasty or mean or gnarly, but you look at it that way. He's just trying to control me. I mean, after all, we're living in the age of freedom where we can't even say male and female anymore. Him or her, it's they. What are you, an it? I mean, it's a crazy society we live in today, and we're so liberated that we're in bondage. We're so free that we're a slave. That's not what God wanted, but that's what the world wants. They want you enslaved and controlled. So either way, they've been established by God. Peter speaks to this situation in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, submit yourselves to every, in the original Greek, it means every, every ordinance of God for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors or as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Are you with me? All authority comes from God. In fact, Jesus is about to be sentenced by Pilate in John chapter 19. And he says this in verse 10. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me, talking to Jesus, knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee and have the power to release thee? Who's he talking to? The one who said, Let there be light. He's talking to the one who made Lucifer. He's talking to the one who made every single atom that's in the universe and molecule and everything that's held together by the word of his power. He's asking a rhetorical question. Only Pilate doesn't know that. Do you not know? This is what you and I say. Don't you know, Lord, I have my rights? Don't you know, Lord, that I am free? Lord, don't you know? Well, of course he knows. Of course he knows. So he says, don't you know that? He says that I have the power to crucify thee and the power to release thee. Verse 11, Jesus answered, thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee is greater than, uh, has the greater sin. It comes from the Father. So Peter, Paul is, or Jesus is saying to Pilate, you I'm going to submit to you because you do have the power to release me or let me go because God gave you the power. But I just want to clarify that for you, Pilate. You don't have any power except God gave it to you. A little footnote there, you know, a little asterisk on there just for old Pilate. I wonder what Pilate thought. You remember his wife already told him, don't mess with this guy. I wonder how he slept after he was crucified. I wonder how he slept three days later after he rose from the grave. I wonder how Pilate, you don't hear much about Pilate in the Bible after John 19, do you? You know, I hope, I hope Pilate became a believer all authority comes from God. Number two, God uses authority to purify our hearts. For 10 years, David is being purified while he's running and learning and growing and maturing, and he's working with men in doubt and distress and debt. He's got, he's got homeless people following him, and hundreds of them keep coming around him. Why? He's learning how to deal with the poor, and he's learning how to deal with the authority, the king, King Saul. He's learning all the things that he needs to learn that he can learn about people by watching and tending sheep. That's why pastors become shepherds after a while. I heard someone say one time, an old preacher, he's probably 80 years old at that time, he said it takes 40 years to make a pastor. You can become a preacher pretty quick, just declaring the truth. But a pastor... That's different. They walk where you walk. They cry when you cry. They're there when you get hurt. They're there when, you, when they are dead tired. They're there when they just got through off of a phone with someone who was ready to commit suicide, and they're there for you to pray with you and walk with you. When your wife passed away, your husband passed away, your kids are in trouble, he's there. That's a pastor. You learn the heart of a king by tending the sheep. You learn it by getting around them, and you know what? You catch what they catch or what they've got. That's why we... I've had more colds in the old days than I've ever had before. Thank God my immune system, I think, is building up. But, but you do. You get that. When you walk with the sheep, you pick up fleas and ticks and bugs and all kinds of crazy things. You go, where'd this come from? I was just at his house. 
<laughs> so David has junk in his heart that God's got to get out. You and I have junk in our heart that God's got to get out. And then God's got character and stuff he wants to put in, and he can only do that while you're learning to submit and to surrender. David's heart needs to be, have some things pulled out and some things put in. Let me give you this truth. It's harder for you to submit to authority the deeper the work God is doing and the bigger the future he has for you. The harder it is for you to submit to the deeper work he's doing, the bigger the future he wants to entrust to you. And I submit to you, Bobby Bonner. Now, I didn't meet Bobby until, what, 30 years ago, I guess. He's out of the same church we're out of up in First Bible George Grace's church in Rochester. God moved me all the way from Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa to New York to learn there is an absolute final authority called the Bible, the Word of God. Not that I didn't believe the Bible was the Word of God, but I found out I've got a book I can trust. And when I met Bobby, I heard his story. I said, I've got to be a part of this guy's life. And our ministry has been a part of your ministry for decades now. Been to Africa once, only got to go once, but boy, what a time. In fact, we were with Brother Mark. We were running the vacation Bible school. I mean, he took 10 people. We took 10 people. We had a blast over hundreds of people. I mean, it was a joy. It was just a blessing. But I watched God do things and listen to Bobby's testimony. And I just Bobby's, and I've heard some of Rose and some of Mark's and other people as well. But just Bobby, because you're familiar with him, how God taught him things with his coaches and how he learned stuff with sports. Because God had to get him prepared to do what he was going to do to go lead thousands of Africans to the Lord. And even though he's not even there, the ministry's still going on. And, and Brother Brian, same way, come over there, spend some time. You know what happens? The Word of God goes with you, and the Word of God stays doing its job. Because people have learned submission. I'll go, Lord. I've watched, you know, I don't want to just tote his horn, but I've watched this guy do without to help other people. And that just makes me want to pour myself more into him and help this man out. I, I just got a great love for this guy. This is, this is a great dear friend. That's why Romans chapter 13 verse 4 says, those leaders are ministers of God for, to thee for good. For good, not for bad. Well, I don't like what they're doing, but for good. So you've had some good leaders and you've had some bad leaders. You've had good authorities and bad authorities. But you know what? You've had people you've loved that challenged you. And you lifted up. Why? Because you submitted to that. If you've grown under the ministry of Brother Mark or uh, Roe or whoever, what you've done is you submitted to the teaching that God has laid on their heart to help you get to that next level of leadership in your life. Amen. See, a bad leader is still God's servant to do you good. I don't like that either. That is hard. And when you're under a bad leader, guess what you learn? You learn character. You learn humility. You learn honor. You learn to love someone that's hard to love. You learn to be desperate for God because, God, you got to do something for me here. I'm having a hard time submitting to this person. Why do you think over 50% of all marriages, including Christian marriages, end in divorce? Because we can't just come under the Lord. You know, God puts two people together for a reason. So for ministry, it's not so you're happy. I get so sick of that word. We just want you to be happy. Come on. Happiness is based on happenings. What if it's bad? It's been bad for the last, you know, if 2021 is as bad as 2020, which I think it may be a little worse in some ways. I'm not happy. God didn't call me to be happy. He called me to have joy. I can have tears streaming down my face and still have the peace and the joy of God because I know he's on the throne and it's okay and whatever's going on down here, he's got it handled. Why should we follow somebody like that? Why should we follow? Why should we obey? Why should we submit? Because that's what God said we should do. That's a simple principle. Some says, it's well, it's beneath me to do this. Then you're actually beneath it. You need to think about that. If God asked you to go clean, let me, let me back up a second. When I was first in the ministry, George Grace and I started on First Bible Baptist Church in Rochester 30 days apart. George quit his job at Kodak, and I quit a very high-paying sales job to go to work at the church. I went from $1,000 a week to $125 a week. Plus, I got Blue Cross, which cost the church like $30 a month, and gas. They had a gas tank out in the back, and I got, I think it was like 25 cents a gallon back in ancient times, I know, I know you know nothing of what I'm speaking of about that. But 
we were out there and, and we were sitting here in that, in that thing and I thought to myself, Lord, what are you doing? Why am I here? And so the very first week, we had these two big, huge buildings, and later on we built a third building, but it was built over an old swamp, and I didn't know that. And what was really strange was that one night it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and the, and the office building next to us, and the church's, uh, what do they call it, uh, the, the sewer thing that's in the ground, Septic tank, yeah, I forget what they are. Septic tank was out in front of the church, and the building was backing up in building number two, the basement. Stuff was coming up with no boots and no gloves. Pastor said, Mike, why don't you go down there and vacuum up all that sludge down there in that room? Yes, sir. I'm down there, and I'm running that vacuum, and I'm sucking up stuff that I wouldn't pick up. And I'm looking at that, and I'm going... Lord, is this what you called me to do? <laughs> and you know what? A few years later, God brought that memory back to me when I was dealing with some difficult situations. And you know what he said to me? Now, I didn't hear this audibly, but he said, do you remember when you were sucking that stuff up in the vacuum? This is compared to that. And I thought, okay, Lord, I learned if I want to be in ministry, I got to do the worst and the lowest thing if I want to get up. And not that I wanted to be up. I just learned that's what you do. And you know, I think the sooner we learn to submit and surrender to the things we don't like, and we don't want to do, they don't like, we don't like what they told us to do, but we do it. It's that when we start to grow, and we'll talk about that in a minute, some real breakthrough. We need a little bit of fear. We need a little bit of awe and wonder and respect. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, it says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath rejected thee from being king. This is when Samuel is being, or Saul is being displaced. He went to the underground. Remember when Saul started out, he was doing good. But by the time he gets to the end, he's not doing so good. He's going to his Ouija board. He's going to his tarot cards. He's going down to the soothsayer. He's going down to his horoscope to find out what his life is. And God says, that's rebellion, Saul. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is engaging in demonic deception to get what you want, where stubbornness is hard to lead, like leading goats, or herding cats. He says it is hard, they're hard to lead, they're difficult, they're resistant to authority, and he said stubbornness is like idolatry. So when I don't submit to authority, I'm actually becoming my own idol. And when I don't submit to authority, I can actually fall myself falling off of the tray into a bucket of demoniac, evil, wicked spirits. That's why you don't want to be rebellious. That's why you parents discipline your children. You love them and you nurture them, but you discipline, you chasten them. Hebrews chapter 12 says the Lord chastens every son that he brings in. Right? If you don't have chastening, you're not a son. You're illegitimate. So they re he was rejected because he re had rebellion and he had stubbornness. So here's the point. Submission teaches us lordship, to surrender to the Lord. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, it says, When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And you only get into the kingdom of God by submitting to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have to put your confidence, your trust, your faith, your belief into what Jesus did on that cross for your sin. It has to become personal. You have to say, well, I know Jesus died for the whole world. No, Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. And you have to make it personal. And when you do, all of a sudden... God starts to work in your life and you see something change. If you want to become a disciple, a learner, a follower of Jesus Christ, it's by submitting and surrendering and denying yourself, taking up your cross and fall. It's not an easy gig. I mean, if it's easy, everybody would do it. It's hard enough to get Christians just to go to church. Do you know the statistics are the average fundamental evangelical Christian goes only two times a month now? And they're saying that after this COVID, if it ever gets over, which... 
why would they waste a good cause, you know, to control? But if it ever gets back to anything normal, the 30 to 40 percent of people who were actively involved in evangelical fundamental churches will never darken the door of a church again. We've gotten lazy, easy. But I don't have, I, I can, you know, I can put it on pause and I can go to the restroom. I can come back and watch it later. I, I want to go play golf this morning. I want to sleep in this morning. I don't want to come over and serve. I just go and get served. God didn't call me to be served. He called me to serve. I'm in the service. Jesus didn't come down here. He came down to serve. And he did the job. And to get it, three years, he redeemed all of mankind by obeying and submitting to the authority of the king. I do always those things that please my father. What I've seen him do and what I've heard him say, I, see, I do and I speak. Wow, three years. Phew, he redeems all of fallen mankind. I've been doing this for 42 years in Las Vegas and five years in First Bible. That's 47 and a half years of my life in ministry. And I ain't scratching the surface of anything. I'm still growing. I'm still maturing. I'm still learning. I'm a student. I'm a learner. I like to submit. I like to help people. I like to come under. You want to be boss? Go ahead. I'll get under you. You get it because you get the bullseye on your head. I don't want the bullseye. I tell that to my staff all the time. I'm transferring the bullseye to your head, okay? So we have to do that. So here's the truth. If I can't submit to my boss, my coach, my teacher, my parent, to the government, to the leader in my life, how in the world am I going to submit to an invisible Jesus? I can't. I won't. Because I can't show up and be submissive to the persons in my house, the persons who's my parent who loved me and birthed me and brought me in this world and feeds me and puts my braces on my teeth and so it has food in the refrigerator and so on and so forth. If I can't submit and surrender to them, I'm not going to submit to somebody I can't even see. It's just not possible. If you can't show up on time and do the assignment and do it because you want to do it and go even the extra mile. Remember Jesus said the guy comes by and says, hey, carry my pack for a mile. Carry it too. Someone says, give me your coat. Give me your shirt too. Go the extra. I see people, they just do the minimum. It's like the minimum payment on your credit card. You'll never pay it off if you keep paying the minimum, right? Don't do the minimum. Go a little extra. And you'll be some amazed at how God stretches your faith and builds you up when you go a little extra. Jesus went a little further and prayed. Jesus went a little further and fell down. What could you not, bro, talk, could you not watch with me for one hour? He does this three times. I tell you what, I would, have, I would have got a thorn and kept sticking myself in the leg to keep me awake or something just so I didn't disappoint my Savior. Can you imagine him saying to you, the Son of God, who just has done everything for them for the last three years, couldn't you watch with me for one hour? Church is only one hour, man. If we go one hour and two minutes, we're, we're, we shut off. You know, our, our butt tells our brain it's time to disengage after 20 minutes. <laughs> right? If I can't submit, where am I going to go? So we need to look at that. Number three, you have to follow before you can lead. I want to spend a lot of time here. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You can only be empowered to the level that you're surrendered. You can only be trusted, let's put it another way, with the power that you need to be trusted with to the level that you surrender your power. In other words, if you want to get up, you've got to get down. You want to lead, you've got to follow. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8, Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee out from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. I love this verse. God is saying to David, David, you're such a good follower, you're going to be a great leader. He, he puts this in the Holy Spirit. This is forever settled in heaven about the story of David. You say, well, David committed adultery, and David got Uriah killed, and David numbered the people, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but the Bible says in Acts, you know, this is a long time after David, he writes, he had a heart after the heart of God. And even though he did the wrong things, his heart was there, his head got screwed up, which is what happens to us. We get him backwards. Well, I just think this is a good thing. Uh, think again. Let the Spirit of God speak to your heart through the Word of God. Listen to me, kings are always followers first. Leaders are always followers first. And remember, if you have the heart of an orphan when you're born physically, and you have the heart of a slave and the heart of a Pharisee, and you have the heart of a person who's an orphan, you're going to have a difficult time with this surrender thing. 
It's going to be natural to be set, have a gift of life, but you can do it. And Jesus is the greatest leader of all time in the universe, the best follower ever. So therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every tongue shall, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of Father. Do you realize these people in politics right now who think that, well, we pray. Well, who do you pray to? You're not praying to the God of the Bible or you wouldn't be doing the other thing. You wouldn't be sucking 64 million babies out of people's wombs if you pray to the God of the Bible. God loves life. God loves children. I'm not saying if you've ever had an abortion that God doesn't forgive. I'm not saying that. What God is saying is this, is that I love life. I am life. He that hath the Son hath life. And Jesus said, I make life. I mean, it takes God to make a human being. And they, they, they want to do that, and let's just keep this going. Let's just keep taking these babies, and let's just keep killing people. And, you know, they keep make, moving the laws up now where it's early birth, you know, late, late term abortions. And You mean to tell me this is righteousness? You know, when the righteous are in authority, even their enemies are at peace with them. That's why we have turmoil all the time, because the righteous are not in authority. You say, well, they're unrighteous, and I shouldn't follow them. Only if it's unbiblical. Only if it's illegal or only if it's immoral, you don't follow them. You draw the line. You say no. Do you remember Peter got arrested over there in the book of Acts? And they beat him and said, go out and don't speak about this man anymore. He no sooner get out of the gate, the door hits him on the rear on the way out, and they start talking about Jesus. You know why? Because God told him to preach the gospel. You do what the word of God says. Yes. Ladies, let me just give you a freebie here. This is no charge. Your husband tells you something. You're supposed to submit and surrender. If he's telling you to do something that's not biblical, illegal, or immoral, you'd say no. You say no. That's the biblical approach. I'm better to obey God than to obey man because they don't know everything. If they're asking you to do something wrong, illegal or immoral, you draw the line. Peter's our good example of that. That's free. That's no charge. So let me ask you a question. Are you a good follower? Because if you're not a good follower, you won't be a good leader. Well, I want to be boss. I want to be in charge. I want to play Zorro. I'll be Zorro. Be a good follower. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Do you notice the word obey? Say it with me. If you don't obey as a child of God in a church, the last part of that verse is, say it with me, with joy, not grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So in other words, the leader of your church is Pastor Mark. If he's asking you to do something that's not illegal, immoral, or unbiblical, you can do it. And he says, if you don't do it, it's going to be unprofitable for you. Now, if you have a portfolio, if you have a savings account, I think what you want is you want profit. You want an increase. The way to get an increase is to decrease. Didn't that what John said? When Jesus comes along, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. He must increase and I must decrease. I got to get down. I got to surrender. I got to obey. Doesn't mean again, do something wrong or horrible. But let's make our leaders have joy for you. When Mark gives up and gives a testimony at the judgment seat of Christ, yep, I taught that and they did it. God says, I know, I just wanted you to verify it, Mark. Good job. Same thing is going to go on for me at our church when we stand before the Lord. So obey them so that their work will be a joy. I mean, why do you think we, I have, when I moved to Vegas, I had a full dark head of hair. And now what hair I have left is absolutely snow white. And so is my, I don't, I don't let it grow out because I look like I'm 200 years old. So I shave it off and deceive people. They think I'm only in my 50s, but I'm long past that. But it comes from trouble. Someone said, gray hair, it's a crown. Yeah, the Bible says that, but it's a crown of trouble. You get gray hair from trouble, folks. But you know what trouble says? I got through it. Like a scar, I got through it. God's trying to do something with you guys. But it takes an obedience and submission to the leadership in your life. You will never know how to rule until you learn how to serve. And let me give you the last thought, and that is that submission brings breakthrough. Submission brings breakthrough. For 10 years, David submits to a bad king, bad boss, a bad leader. 
but he becomes the, the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you read Matthew chapter 1. That's breakthrough. Okay, well, he has a sorted past of some things. But overall, he's got a heart after the heart of God. And David could have, after he killed Goliath, because he picked up those four extra stones, could have said, Saul, you're next, and try to speed up the process to get where he needed to go. But submission is all about trust. And that's why David was able to pull back and said, God will take care of him one way or the other, and one day I will be king, so let's don't worry about it. And so he calms his, groups around, his group around and does the same thing. There's a very interesting story in 1 Samuel chapter 26 about a servant of David's called Abishai. And they're going to decide, that they want to sneak down into the army where Saul is. And somehow God puts a deep sleep on them in 1 Samuel 26. But verses 8 to 11, I just want you to think about this for a moment. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now, therefore, let me smite him, I pray thee, with a spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him a second time. In other words, I'll just have to stick him once and he'll be dead. I won't have to do it twice. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said further, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. Uh, his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take thou now thy spear, uh, the spear and, uh, that is at his bolster and the cruise of water, and let him go. So David takes the jug of water and the spear, and Abishai says, okay, because he doesn't stick him and kill him. Why and how did Abishai not say, this is my man, David's my man. He's brought me out of debt and distress and discouragement, and I'm going to do this because he is his enemy. We just discussed he was his enemy. I'm going to kill him. You know why he couldn't do it? Because he watched the heart of David say, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. That's why leadership is so important. That's why you're going to follow the right people. You're going to get to the right place. If you're going to follow someone who's trying to build you up and edify you, you will get to that level of maturity where God can really use you. David had such a great example in Abishai's life because he watched him for 10 years being faithful. You've watched Mark, you've watched Brownie, you've watched Roe for years and decades be faithful when we could quit or go do something else. I mean, physically perhaps, we can't do it because there's something inside of us that God says, no, you can't do that. You just can't do it. So parents, it's important to you to how you speak to your children about authority. If you are running down your kids' coaches, your kids' teachers, and the whole system in front of you, you do that in front of them, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when they get teenagers. They're going to look at you, and they're going to start looking at you just the same way as a Pharisee as you looked at them, their parents, their leaders, I mean, their coaches. So be careful. I know you have a lot of sports programs around here, so be kind to your coaches. If you're going to think it, think it, but don't tell your kids about it, right? Just be supportive. Keep praying if you have a bad leader, a bad coach, bad parent, bad husband, bad wife. Keep seeking God. Keep submitting. And what's going to happen is God will give you a chance to go through. Because in the Bible, when the lepers came by Jesus and he said, go tell the priests and let them declare you clean. When they went on their way, they were cleansed. In the Bible, when Peter is on the boat and they've been fishing all night, can't catch anything, he says, throw the net on the other side. And again, Peter's a professional fisherman. The boats were 8, 10, 12 feet at the very most wide. Here's logic. Logic says, what is 10 feet going to make a difference? Come on. What are you talking about? That's like saying, go to the left and not to the right, and you'll find your pot of gold. So, okay, nevertheless, at your word, we'll let it down, and you know the story. They bring in the net. They could hardly pull it in. And what happens with Peter? This is the transformational start with Peter. He said, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He jumps into the water and goes over to be with Jesus and leaves the very thing that was the source of his income. That's a submittive heart, a submission and a surrender that God is after. And he does it. How about when those disciples were out there, Lord, here's a big crowd. Well, how are we going to feed them? He says, well, here's what you do. Go see what you got. We don't have anything. In fact, one guy says if we had 200 penny worth of bread, we wouldn't be able to feed any, all of them a little bit. So when Jesus says, go get what you have, hey, there's a kid with a sack of lunch over here, a few fishes and some barley loaves. Okay, bring them to me. Can you imagine the disciple that brought that bag to Jesus? Like, we just said 200 penny worth, you know, like 10 years worth of salary is enough to give these people a crumb. He's bringing that bag over. I wonder what he's thinking. 
What's he going to do with this? How in the world? Why am I? Why did he have me carry the bag over? Why didn't he have Judas? After all, he's always carrying the bag. And maybe Judas carried I don't know. But he's bringing it over and he gives it to Jesus. And Jesus said, Father, show him yourself through me. Bam, bam, bam. Okay, boys, keep feeding them. Here, give me some more baskets. Keep feeding them. Keep. And you know the story. There were 12 baskets of fragments left over. You say, do you believe that? I believe as much as I'm standing here. Now what do you think that apostle thought when he carried that bag over? Like, that's a nothing. I got this big basket of food. Um, you know what I would have done? I think. I'd have gone back to the kid and said, here, for your investment, this is your return. You planted some seed faith money. Let's get a basket of re- re- return, you know? But can you imagine that scene? And yet they still doubted the Lord. I mean, what does God have to do in the lives of some people to get them to believe? God says, if you won't believe what I said and what I did, you won't believe, like Lazarus, someone who's come back from the dead. The word of God is power. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a divider of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's a place where you can come and find grace and help in time of need. The word of God is not just a book you read on Sunday. It's a book that you fall in love with, and it changes your life, your your future, your history, your children. It changes the world, and he's trying to do it just through you, through simple submission. By the way, obedience and submission are different. Obedience is physical. Submission is spiritual. Obedience is external. Submission is in the heart. For example, I'm supposed to read chapters 1 through 3 for John, okay, for the day's reading. I checked it off. I did it, but my heart wasn't in it. I shared the illustration this morning. I remember it a long time ago, and I've never forgotten it. A lady was driving in a car with a little boy in the back, and this was before seatbelt laws and all that stuff, and she kept, the kid kept making noise and screaming and yelling. She said, now, you need to sit down, or I'm going to stop this car and paddle you. Now, you may, some of you new parents may not know what that means. That means there's corporal punishment. That means the Board of Education goes to the seat of understanding. You know, it's, not, it's beyond time out. Anyway, so she says, I'm going to stop this car, and I'm going to paddle your rear end. Kid kept it up, kept it up, kept it up. And she was getting so frustrated. I tell you, number two, if I had to stop this car, I'm going to paddle you, and it's going to hurt. Kid kept doing it. So she pulls the car over, and the kid sits down. And they start driving off, and the boy says to the mother, well, I'm sitting in the car, but I'm standing in my heart. And if you think about it, that's what the difference is between obedience and submission. Yeah. Submission is Here's my heart. I'm doing it because of my heart. I'm doing it because you're in my heart. I'm doing it because this will please you. I'm doing this because you're my king. You're my father. I praise you. I thank you for your sacrifice to give me. I'm here for you. Obedience is I just did the thing I was supposed to do. We need to be obedient. It's better to be obedient than to sacrifice. But if you think about sacrifice, it's still a physical thing. You can do sacrifice without the right heart. That's why the whole issue of salvation in the New Testament, it doesn't really tell you about going to offer the sacrifice of the Old Testament with the right heart. You should, but it's not a requirement. But in the New Testament, man believeth unto righteousness with his heart, Romans chapter 10. So the issue now is the heart. So for us in the New Testament, 21st century, it's our heart. The issue about us is our heart. In Matthew 15, 8, it tells us this, the people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, obedience, And honors me with their lips, obedience, but their heart is far from me. They're not submitted. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. I love that verse because he said everything that you do, in word or deed, do to the glory of God. In Colossians 3, 22 and 23, Servants obey obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart. Fearing God, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. He's talking to men and women who are under some tough authority in Colossians. When Paul writes that, those people were being abused and oppressed, and the Gnostics were coming in and trying to get them to do heady stuff because they wanted to circumvent the heart. And you cannot circumvent the heart. So it's just so good to be and have the heart of the Lord Jesus so I don't have to be a rebel anymore. I don't have to be a slave anymore. I don't have to be an orphan anymore. I don't have to be lost anymore.
by faith. You say, well, how, how in the world can I submit? Well, David submitted to Pot- or Joseph submitted to Potiphar. You find David submitted to Saul. Daniel submitted to Nebuchadnezzar. He was kind of a bad guy. Jesus submitted to Pilate, and Paul submitted to Nero. I think if you can submit to your boss, to your husband, to your leader, you're in good company. You're in a good category. By the way, the greatest breakthrough of all was the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And he caused salvation to take place for all of us, to enter in by faith. But you have to submit and surrender and trust and believe that Jesus died for you and that he rose for you so you could be justified. And he sits at the right hand of the Father ever to live and make intercession for you and I because just like David, we screw up and mess up and do stupid things. But Jesus said, Father, I'll handle it. And that's Hebrews 12. He comes and he says, Son, uh, I'm just going to talk to you first. Now, I told you not to do that, so listen up. He's going to give you a chance. I don't know how long it's going to take. But if you don't listen, like my old grandma used to say, if you don't listen, you're going to feel. So he says, okay, now, son, you didn't listen, so bend over. What do you mean bend over? Yeah, touch your toes. Why? Because you're in time out, and it's going to hurt in time out. Whack! Whoa! Kind of a broad distribution of the paddle. So you get the point. God's trying to say, you need to stop that or you need to start that. And you get the point. You don't, need, you don't need your Ouija board to tell you, hey, I did something wrong and I better get straightened out. I don't need to go down to the, to the soothsayer and have her read my tea leaves. I just know I screwed up and something's going on here. I better get right with God. And I think if we're honest, most of us know when God's talking to us. Well, okay, I listened. I got the rod. Now, I'm still not doing right. God says, okay, I got this little thorn over here. He says, you don't even need to bend over. Next thing you know, he sticks you at it so sharp. He might stick you right in the wallet. Some of you might have financial problems. You need to give God first. You need to trust God. See, by giving, you live by faith. That's why he said, prove me. He sticks a thorn. It might be your car's your God. Your TV's your God. Your sports team's your God. By the way, I'm sorry about Kansas City. I was rooting for him. But anyway, I'm normally a Broncos fan, so don't hold that against me, okay? I probably lost you now for the rest of the message. But he takes that thorn and he sticks that in there and he says, you know, I want you to get the point. you got something ahead of me. Now, if you're really stubborn and unsubmissive, God talks to you. God pulls out the rod. God has a thorn. And then the last thing he does is he pulls out a knife. And he says, I need to take you home. You're better off over here because you just mess up. You don't want to listen. So I can't use you if you don't listen because you're not going to submit and surrender. So I want to encourage you today. A wise man will hear instruction and be yet wiser. But to a fool, wisdom is folly. If you're listening today, you're here today, and you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, he did the most amazing thing he could do for anybody, which is to die for you so you could have eternal life. And you get that by trusting in him by faith as the Lord and Savior of your life. You invite the heart of a king into your heart. If you're a Christian, you need to submit. And when you start, you take your first baby steps of submission or surrender, you're going to find you're going to get stronger and stronger, just like your baby taking those first few steps, and now they're running on a track team in high school. And you go, where did the time go? Because they took those first steps. Surrender. We sing that song, I Surrender All, on Sunday morning from 9 to 10.30 or from 10.30 to 12, and then the rest of the week is mine. That's kind of the logic of it, isn't it? God says, look, I gave you eternal life. Not when you die. John chapter 3 says, this is eternal life. He gives you eternal life when you get born again. You have it as a present tense. When my wife's heart stopped beating from that cardiac arrest, immediately she, was, she wasn't transforming and floating up through the universe. She was there. And every saved person, when that happens, they're in the presence of God. I'll tell you what. You know, then you're going to speak of the praises of God. So he wants you to do it down here. Everybody's a servant and a follower of God up there. It's down here with the choices. So let's do that, shall we? Let's bow for prayer. Father, I thank you for the honor and the privilege to share your holy word and these tremendous principles of submission. 
Lord, and I'm not trying to give the attitude and the concept that I have arrived completely, but I am trying to be more submissive now than I was last week and last year and 10 years ago and 40 years ago. And I thank you for being patient with me and patient with your people. Lord, this city, this city, this state, this country needs the Lord Jesus Christ to be displayed in the hearts of your people as kings, not servants and slaves and orphans and Pharisees. Father, I pray you'd teach and do something in us that only you can do, and I thank you for it. With our heads so bowed, Pastor Mark.